The stuff I will say during her presentation, I'm with the USDA, I'm a soil biochemist. My background is more with the soil organic matter. I'm a work, we look at this organic matter in the soil where it's building blocks of carbohydrates and phenols and stuff. But another name for organic matter is humus. And because of my background with humus, the human product companies came to me starting in 2008. This is when Alex's company came to me and asked me to get involved with them as a third party evaluator of the product. Um, uh, some of the guys, people in our company were new to this product and they honestly wanted to know, does this product work, yes or no? And if it doesn't work, they wanted to know that, so we won't invest in it. And so that's how I got involved back in 2008, and uh, right away I thought I could see, you could see some response, some, you know, you had to look, you can't see this from a mile away, but if you walk in the rows and look at the plants, you can see, you can see minor differences. There was something going on, um, and I've been involved with these products ever since then. Um, as a USDA, I, I, will, I cannot tell you that this, buy this product. I'm here just to give you information and you decide. I'm not here to promote this company's product. I work with two other companies. I don't want to promote their products either. I'm here to be a scientific evaluator. What have we learned about this product? How is it performing? Why, my, Shannon asked me to talk a little bit about why this product might be working. So that's my job here. Okay, you ready to go? So I'm Alex, I've been with Yuli Niner for a few years now. I'm a sales rep, so I don't know all the scientific stuff like Dan does. But I'm gonna start out by showing you a video that we have. It gives good information on it. And it's only Help with is increase your biomass, 
increase the photosynthesis in the leaf area, extends the black layer, um, increase the root size, the root ball can be increased by 25%, increase lignin by 10 to 10%, and then we help produce more nodules so you can get more nutrients for the uptake for your plant as well. Uh, the stalk is thicker, so there, it helps with better sustainability. Uh, increased stem cells and pollination can be advanced by one to two days. And you can get drier kernels and the ear lengths are more consistent. And on the beans, we increase the biomass by 10 to 15% as well. And it, the roots are increased by 30%. The nodules are increased by 20 to 35%. And those are the little balls on the roots. Um, the, it increases yield on beans to the average, or the average is five on corn, it was 7.6. And then we have, excuse me, more, we have better plant health. So you, it helps get to the, through the waxy surface and it makes it stronger and healthier so it helps repel the fungal pressure. So some people don't necessarily use a fungicide if they use yield igniter just because it increases the plant health of the overall plant. Uh, human folic acid, we get ours from Wonderite. You, there's other products, they get it from seaweed, all kinds of stuff, right? Compost, yeah. um, uh, oxidized lignite, um, dopamine, you know, that's an animal waste. Yeah. yeah, so that varies too. And then, so ash that you'll ignite can help with are, it's in a plant form, it's ready, as soon as you put it on the plant, it gets through the waxy surface within 15 minutes. So we have some pictures of that online. Uh, guaranteed consistency, um, it's mass produced, we have a patent ex extraction process. And let's see, consistent results, I told you about the 993. Getting mass produced. Do you guys have any questions so far? Okay. Yield igniter is packaged in two and a half gallon jugs or mini bulbs or a tanker. Uh, some, it depends what works for you, how you want to order it. The jugs, you want to make sure you agitate everything really well before you do mix it in. There's not a lot of tank issues. Most people mix it with just about anything. You can use it starter with your starter 1034 if you want. Uh, you can use it with your herbicide too, which is what a lot of people do, which is good information. Um, okay. uh, Alex wasn't with the company that far back, so I was a historian, I'll step in. Yeah. <laughs> um, uh, uh, a couple sentences on the background. Uh, for those of you who don't know unique products, um, in the United States, they're mainly made from what we call Leonardite. Uh, Leonardite is a young, immature coal. It's in between peat and hard coal in its degree of decomposition. Peat might be a few thousand years old, you know, swampish type material that's been buried and it's decomposing. Hard coal might be two or three hundred million years old. Leonardite is in between there, it's about maybe a million years old. There's large Leonardite deposits up in North Dakota. Uh, Leonardite is named after uh, Dr. Leonard, who was the state geologist in North Dakota. Uh, what I heard, uh, how they came across this whole idea in the first place, was the Leonardite is an overburden over some of the lignite deposits in North Dakota. And it was shoveled off, maybe get after the lignite. And Dr. Leonard noticed that the plants that then grew on this stuff that was shoveled off to the side seemed to be growing better. And that's how they came up with the idea that maybe this Leonardite has some growth enhancing properties. Um, so in the United States, typically these products are made through a, an alkali extraction of the Leonardite just to get it into a soluble form. And then you might reacidify to get the pH back down to a normal pH, and then it gets applied to plants. In Europe, uh, they tend to make, they have Leonardite there as well. The western, uh, near the Ruhrgebiet area in Germany is a big uh, Leonardite area, lignite area. Brown coal is what they call it over there. They also make a lot of their products from compost. Uh, I think in Australia as well, you see both types. The, these products are in general not well investigated in the scientific area. They're getting more and more attention. 
Um, the Ohimi product industry has been around for some decades now, since at least the 70s. Um, they are aware of the reputation as being a snake oil industry. Uh, you can you don't know what you're buying when you buy these things. Just some dark colored solution. It could be molasses, for all you know. And they see the need to bring in more science to make it a more knowledge-based industry so the consumer has a better idea of what it is that they're buying and what these products can actually do. Uh, they've got a long ways to go yet. Um, they're fighting decades of, of reputation as being <coughs> snake oil. Um, companies have to learn to make claims based on data, not on what they would like to say. Um, so that's what human products are. Uh, um, the timeline here, um, yeah, the uh, uh, Chad Calloway and his fellow investors in AgLogic came to me in 2008 and said we'd like third-party evaluation of this yield igniter. We want to know whether it works or not. If it doesn't work, tell us. We won't invest our money in. Um, so we set up studies started in, starting in 2009, different field studies around the Radcliffe area where the product was being produced and still is being produced. Um, being with the U.S., the first line there, they wanted to know, good or bad, does the product work? Don't, don't hide the truth, just be real blunt with it. Uh, being with the USDA, I'm all about helping American farmers uh, impact doing something useful with our time, and this seemed like something that at least needed investigation. Uh, yeah, these products have been around. Uh, um, I'm, I'm active in a professional society on human substances, and we've got several companies that are members in that society, and we know nothing about them. They sell their product, but you might call it a cottage industry. Uh, they have not gotten the attention of the research community because of the snake oil reputation, yet they continue to sell their products at some low level. There are people who buy these things. So it makes you think maybe there's something going on here. Um, the the egg logic people, I guess, share my desire to know things on a factual basis. You know, let's get numbers to see what these products actually do. Um, this product has been, uh, there are other companies also that have lots of field trials, but there are many more companies that do not have uh, this number of field trials, testing the product. Especially uh, with the uh, egg logic, there's an interest in when and where does this product work? Like we were talking about a minute back, it, these products don't work all the time. And if you've got ideal growing conditions, they don't seem to help too much. If you've got a really awful soil where you're getting, you know, uh, 90 or 100 bushels uh, per acre on corn, the product might not work either. And there's some horrible growth limitation. But there are places where it can work. Uh, in some places, more than others. Um, so, um, yeah, the first point, we just we want to help the farmers, uh, both this company, but also certainly with the USDA. I'm all about impact and helping people. Um, number two, um, that's what we've been able to do with, with egg logic is look at different environmental conditions. We've been doing research now since 2009. We have different years, different weather patterns, different soil types. We have some ideas uh, of when and where the product works. Um, and yeah, we try to do things carefully as possible. Point three, um, uh, in our favorable growing conditions here in Iowa, you're not going to get a 20 or 30 bushel yield increase. You might, typically we see 5, 6, 7, 8, 9 bushels yield increase. If you're already getting 160 without the product, that's not a huge percent increase and you have to be very careful to, if you want to consistently get that type of a, a 5, 6, 7 percent yield increase. You have to be pretty careful with your work. We have lots of field replications. We do formal statistical analyses. Uh, the USDA has not been involved in all these sites. We think these are uh, demonstration trials that I have, that AgLogic has done over the years. Um, 2009, 10, and 11, they would put a strip on a farmer's field that the farmer would call up and say, I want to see your product on my land. And they would, they would go do that. Um, 144 farms. Uh, yeah, 7.6, um, I'll show a little bit of data in my presentation. Um, that's about what we, we did a three year on farm survey, 195 farms total with demonstration strips on. Um, uh, from, uh, and that was the average increase we saw with our hand samples where we collected uh, one meter sections and uh, looked at them for, for grain weight. We, we tried to get the combine data from the farmers but they weren't really willing to share those data. And we understand why. Um, the, on the upper right corner, what we're primarily seeing with the yield response in corn 
is that the yield response is coming from uh, more homogeneous ear length. Uh, it's mainly the smaller plants that are getting longer ears with yield length. We're not necessarily helping the big plants. The big ears aren't necessarily getting any bigger. It's the smaller ears that are becoming longer. So you have more uniform ear length. You're getting more production from the weaker plants in the field. I'll show you those data in my presentation. Um, while this, I think, repeats a lot, um, leaf area, uh, uh, we've, we've been looking at leaf area. That's a measure of the growing conditions that the plant has seen. If the plant has seen good growing conditions, it will make a bigger leaf to take advantage of these good growing conditions. So if you measure the leaf area for all the leaves on the corn plant, you're getting a history for the whole growing season how well was the plant seen uh, for growing conditions when each of those leaves was developing. So we, we do that a lot. We typically see, you know, in a year with some stress, we might see a five to six, seven percent increase in leaf area with the yield igniter. Um, in really good years, uh, like we've had recently, we might see a two or three percent increase in leaf area. Um, yeah, okay, I already mentioned the point in the upper right there that uh, the main yield response is coming from uh, more uniform ear length. Um, let's see here. Yeah, we, uh, uh, the SPAD meter, we've looked at, we don't, we have some data on this, not a lot. We look, we're measuring photosynthesis rate. Uh, really, we just did that in one year in one field, and we saw, we did see a minor increase in uh, the greenness, how green the plant was. Um, with, with the SPAD meter. Um, I, in this, uh, the rest of that is pretty much uh, repeated information. Um, is it back to you, Nico? Yeah. Okay, go ahead. So, the SPAD meter information, there's some data on that in your packets that I pointed out to you if you want to check that out as well. This was done down in southern Iowa by the MFA. So this is just some information, some of their yield that data that they got. And they saw a lot of good things using yield igniter down there. Significant amounts that they sometimes were afraid to say. Okay, then no cherry picking. So what we do is we go out and find, is there seven plants? Yes. Yeah, seven plants that are all consistent when we get data out. So we don't pick the best or the worst in each plot that we go through. And then this is, I think this was done in Southern Iowa as well, and what we were trying to show is the difference in the root ball and the size of the biomass of the plant. You can see it right there, it's a lot bigger. It's just something for you to see. In 2013, we signed another five-year agreement with the USDA to do more research and testing with them. And then, Shannon, you like the added up sheets, right? Uh, Chad said that, where it talks about uh, different things, which will be on the next page. But this goes with price of what you can get in your pocket, your, your ROI on corn, and there's a sheet in your packet as well that you can fill that out for yourself and decide what price you want to put in there as well. And this is what I was talking about with you. There's another sheet in there and it talks about how we can help your overall investment and it doesn't take a lot for us to put money in your pocket. Because if you look at all those archives, it's a lot of helps with a lot of things that those do so that you can get it all with one product. And this is soybean information. You can see the difference there with the root mass and then the size of the plant as well. Some people that I've worked with have seen less lodging with yield and more pods on the plant, and sometimes they just can't believe how many pods are on there. So they're pretty happy with it on there. Here's another picture. This is just trying to show the plant health, how we help make it a stronger, healthier plant. You can see the difference there. And that's a good visual for people to see how we help with fungal pressure as well. And then this is a sudden death syndrome picture. This is actually up by Minnesota, north of Osage. And you can see where they shut the booms off and right to the line where they sprayed it. And the only thing different, the only difference that they used on this field was yielding nighter. 
and they used it with their post herbicide, and it was a 10 bushel advantage. So, you guys use it in Olivo? Have you heard of Olivo? I want to see the difference between Olivo and Gilligan, or see if we could do a test like that to see how that would work. So I'm not sure how much that is in acres, but they label these as huge treatment. So, just something that I think would be interesting. And then here's the added up sheet for the corn, or for the beans, and you can really increase your profit if you use the igniter on it, and you can see a good yield buck with it. And then here's a little bit more on the corn. You can see the transient height difference. So by our test plot, we you can just drive by and see the difference between the plots where it has been sprayed. So it's just kind of interesting for people to actually see that. But it's nice you can just drive by and visually see it. So let's see. And then we just want to keep doing research because we want to understand how the product works, how humic and folic acid works. Um, the average increase on corn is 7.6, we went over that. Through on soybeans it's 5. The plant health really helps a lot of things. If you don't necessarily see yield, you will see a plant health difference, typically. Uh, a lot, if you have, like Jan said, in a good growing season, you don't always see a yield bump, like within a bad growing season, but it varies all the time. So that's something to think about. Some gentlemen that I work with, they always say, a good product to use for three years in a row because you can really see all the benefits that help with the plants and then in your field even. And then I think a lot of other people say it's simple because they don't have pain points like the shoes, so something that they like. And then do you want me to show the fungicide again that I have? The you want to see that? You guys want to see that? Kind of long. <laughs> I'll get it going, and then you guys can ask questions if you want. How does that sound? I'm trying the observation that we made this last year. We had four sites um, where we applied uh, yield igniter at the V6 stage corn, uh, with the last spray of, of uh, herbicide, and I measured the circumference of the, the stalks at about the uh, R1 stage. So at tassel time. And we got a pretty consistent quarter inch bigger radius, not radius, um, circumference, <laughs> measuring around. And it was pretty much a quarter inch, and, you know, uh, maybe a little beyond that. Uh, but also what we saw was, uh, as they had indicated, there's uh, there's less senescence, in other words, we had more stay green in the fall, uh, and uh, Three of the farmers that I worked with said they, they saw that when they combined that the corn was was greener, so much like our fungicides. But the other interesting thing that I, I did some literature review on these products, and Dr. Wolf, maybe you can uh, you know, substantiate that or shoot it down. But when I when I did some research, uh, there's been a lot of research on not only corn, soybeans, but potatoes, and I think some wheat, and what they're thinking right now is that these products act like a uh, plant growth promoter, so an auxin, uh, A-U-X-I-N, and we use, a, we use an auxin as a herbicide, and the two products we use is 2,4-D and Bandrel. And if you recall, when you spray that on, on a weed, it makes the weed go crazy. It just you know, grows real fast and kind of starves itself. Well, that's at high rates. At low rates, it actually promotes root shoot growth, right? And that's what they're thinking that they're, these these products are doing is they're it's promoting more uh, fine roots, you know, so, and that's where they're getting the, the benefit. Uh, well, I'll get into that in my presentation. Yeah, they do promote root growth. Yeah. Um, the company, the industry assumes that kind of as a given. They all see that. Right. Uh, we don't have a lot of numbers, but I, we do have numbers now. Okay. Um, my presentation was getting into, but the roots seem to respond a little late in the season to help with 
these other benefits we see earlier in the season. So we're wondering right now whether the roots are themselves another side effect of the product. They are, that's good they do that. But the underlying cause, we're guessing, this is a guess, we don't know for sure, but we're guessing it is some type of a plant biostimulant, um, like what you were saying earlier. That, that, uh, it may affect, uh, it just it may make the plant a little more vigorous so it can respond better to whatever stress comes along. In this area, we see drought stress. There are other products in other places used on other crops. Uh, it might be cold stress or salinity stress. Um, uh, potatoes, or studies on potatoes showing with the evening product, you get a more uh, evenly shaped potato, uh, a grade one, I believe they're called, which gives a higher market price. They don't have any creases or dimples in them. And what our understanding is that those dimples or creases develop when a potato is encountering stress. Um, and if it has no stress, you get the big round potato. So with this unique product, they got more potato weight and also a higher quality potato, meaning there was less stress encountered by the plant during the season. We have several lines of evidence suggesting that these, these crops can deal better with whatever stress comes their way when they're amended with the product which would seem to point the finger at some type of a plant stimulant. Um, we cannot exclude, nobody's taking measurements on whether the microorganisms may be involved in this. Um, they may well be, but we don't know uh, whether the microbes are in the soil or in the plant. Now, some people apply these products after the harvest. When they're, you get this big layer of crop residue post-harvest, you want to decompose it more quickly. Some people put fumic products on that mass of stover to decompose it more quickly. They claim it works. I personally have no idea. But if that is true, that would suggest microbes are also stimulated by these products. Um, we don't think the effect is some type of a nutrient effect. The application rates are too low. Yield igniter, three pints per acre. That's not enough to make any difference for nutrient availability, certainly for N, P, or K. I mean, you're talking about did you tell me about one pound per acre is what that amounts to? Yeah, if you're applying three pints per acre of yield igniter, that's next to nothing for N, P, or K. Now, there's a possibility that maybe these products are making micronutrients more available. And then that kind of an application rate might become important. But we have some data, I have one slide I'll show you, where if you apply too much of a unique product, you not only get less than your optimal benefit, but you might even get a yield loss compared to your check, your control. And so that to me does not sound like a nutrient effect. I mean, why would you get a yield loss? Instead of three pints per acre, you apply six pints per acre, which is still a pretty low rate. Why would that give you a yield loss? I don't think it's a nutrient-based mechanism. I think it's something else. And that's why, uh, like Shannon was saying, I mean, if you apply too much of 2,4-D, you're overstimulating plants, and that can, you know, you can tell them that, but that's how it functions on the herbicide. Maybe these unique products are somewhat related to that. Maybe they are plant biostimulants, and if you apply too much, you're getting too much of a good thing, and you get you know, impaired growth. But we're guessing right now. Nobody knows for sure. And we've got few, several years of research ahead of us to really understand these things. Where my presentation will be mostly looking at different pieces of field data we have. What do they tell us about how these unique products might be functioning? Are you? No. Where are you at? I'm good. We're done. You're done? Yeah. Because I can just talk a little bit about being open. Sure, sure. Just 